David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Tuesday, June 6th, 2023. Time for another show. Thankfully, not time for another invasion of Europe. Uh, so that's good news. 79th, is that right? 79th anniversary, I guess, of D-Day. Uh, something to mark. Just really, honestly, I'm astonished by the passage of time. Uh, I'm thinking about it today, uh, just because I was thinking, hey, June 6th. Well, okay. One, I, I know that date, and I wonder whether increasingly uh, younger and younger people just don't. But uh, they probably thought that we wouldn't either, the people who are my age. But I do recall, I don't know, it sort of just sort of got me thinking that, uh, as I recall back in uh, 1984, so I'm in, oh, I don't know, uh, sophomore, junior year of high school, I guess, and I recall so June of... 84 would have been the end of the sophomore year, right? Okay, but I remember that, you know, uh, well, for one thing, I remember that people at the time, back in my day, they were, you know, very frequent readers and subscribers to leading news weekly magazines, a completely outdated concept at this point. But uh, I don't remember, it was Time, Newsweek, whichever one, I'm sure both of them had something. But they uh, featured prominently the 40th anniversary of D-Day, uh, which, you know, I mean, 40 is a big number, but it, it wasn't the 50th anniversary. It just it sort of struck me as odd even at the time. Well, 40, you know, uh, of course, why wait 10 years and uh, in 10 years we'll do the 50th anniversary and it'll be fine. And uh, I guess it sort of struck me about the passage of time that, well, for one thing, at 40 years, the anniversary, lots of, and lots and lots of veterans of D-Day itself and um, uh, people who uh, were surviving friends and family of people who had either died or survived uh, D-Day. They were around, you know, so, and it wasn't entirely clear that all of them would be around for the 50th anniversary. So it you know, made a certain amount of sense. And now we're approaching 80, double that. 80 years strikes me as, I mean, I guess it had been... Well, let's see. Uh, so, yeah, right about the same time, it was about 80 years since, you know, more like give, take, give or take a few years, 80 years since the end of World War One, And I imagine, you know, that that even to me at the time seemed like, well, that's really ancient history. World War Two was, you know, history old because it happened before I was born. So I had no sense of it. Whereas there were other people who were like, well, now 40 years ago. You know, now being 50 plus years old, thinking about things that happened 40 years ago, it was a long time, but I remember it. It's not ancient history the same way, but 80 years, well, there are fewer and fewer people around who will remember that. Anyway, just, I, I don't know. It struck me as one of those things. I think about the comparisons of the passage of time, things like that all the time. Uh, I don't know. I'm obsessed with that sort of thing, but that and the pronunciation of everything, so... You know, two useless objects. Anyway, uh, time for another show, as it happens. And uh, commemoration of uh, D-Day. I don't know if there's anything official. You know, it's 79. They're probably waiting around for the 80 next year. Even though, you know, like we said, you never know when people are going to be around. Uh, so I'm certain they're, they're marking the date. But there won't be any news weekly covers. But that's only, all, you know, perhaps only because there are no more news weeklies. So, you know, there's also that. All right, time for us to start the show and get in on all of the fun action of the stories of the day, including the stories that people are suggesting to me either uh, right now or uh, last night. But I didn't see because I turned off the machines and went to bed. Uh, but John Shiflett's awake and listening and letting everybody know that uh, also on June 6th today, it's, well, let's see, what has he got today? He always has, well, not always, but I guess this is lately the new habit, including uh, items of the day, you know, things that happened today, national observances, people's, you know, famous people's birthdays. That's always been an interesting one to add. Uh, what do we have today? 
June 6th, the birthday of Russian poet. Oh boy, how am I going to pronounce Russians? Uh, Alexander Pushkin. That's not a hard one. And Russian Language Day at the United Nations. So you can use their native language to tell them, for instance, it's a war crime to bomb dams that would endanger civilian populations, which I guess is the big news of the day in the Ukraine front. Uh, a major hydroelectric dam uh, bombed by the Russians, which you would think would be kind of a strategic target for them early on. Um, but apparently uh, there's a convention in the you know war crimes convention about that bombing dams that would uh, flood major uh, civilian population centers. And uh, I guess that's why you don't immediately, uh, it's supposed to be there so that people don't immediately flee downstream areas once war breaks out, thinking any day they're going to bomb this dam. And of course, it kills, you know, has the potential to kill thousands of civilians. So, well, they'll have to straighten that one out and they can straighten it out in the Russian language as they work things out at the UN. Let's see. Uh, here's something else he sent on this subject. Google translated from Russian. June 6th, the birthday of the great Russian poet A.S. Pushkin. As part of the program to support and develop multilingualism and cultural diversity, the UN celebrates the Day of Russian Language. One of the goals of this program is to maintain the equality of all six official languages of the UN. Uh, do you know what they were? English. Yes. Arabic. Sure. Spanish, Chinese, Russian, and French. The Russians, I think, sort of strong-armed their way into that one as members of the Permanent Security Council uh, because, of course, uh, they stood as one of the victorious allies of World War II and could do that sort of thing. English makes a little more sense in the term, in sense that we have forced England, well, oh, yeah, I guess we have as well, but English was forced on plenty of people around the planet through colonialism, and so, okay, they can speak it, so uh, uh, never mind the history of why they can speak it, they can speak it, and we need to speak to one another now, so let's go ahead and use it. Arabic, uh, well, you know, not dissimilar, I guess. Uh, you, you, you might say, well, it wasn't Western colonialism that forced Arabic on a vast swath of the Middle East and the Levant, but it was uh, Arabic colonialism as they swept through the region in a religious fervor and forced their language on others. Okay, so uh, that's a lot of them, and we need to be able to speak to people who speak it, and of course the spread of Islam through less aggressive means, though, in some cases, probably also spread the language. Spanish colonialism, sorry about that one. Chinese I think, well, certainly some colonialism as well, uh, expansionism anyway, uh, or what do they say, imperialism, uh, though they deny all those labels, but also by virtue of already having a billion speakers. So, you know, a fifth of the planet is exposed to that on a daily basis anyway. Russian, meh, not so much. French, also colonialism. Uh, there's certainly been plenty of Russian expansionism, but they still haven't reached as many people as some of these other languages. But OK, so some of the uh, certainly some of the Central Asian and uh, Eastern populations of Russia would uh, would beg to differ, I guess, if we went and combed through their history about why it is that they're capable of speaking Russian. And they're right. All right. Let's see. What else have we here? Oh, John adds, uh, would it be impolite to remind white supremacists who love the purity of Russia uh, the supposed purity of Russia, Nordic Vikings, etc., of Pushkin's African ancestry. Um, well, it has, depends who you ask. Uh, me, I don't find it impolite at all. White supremacists, maybe that's the term they would use for it, but I don't think you have to worry about it too much. It, even if they thought it was perfectly within bounds, they'd still probably uh, advocate for your death. So, you know. There's always that. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's an interesting bit of news being teased here. Matthew Rigdon uh, off of the, what was the, your favorite beat? Uh, <laughs> I forget already. Uh, the, oh, yeah, Tucker Carlson, right. Uh, well, now we know, it says here, who isn't Lauren Boebert's father? Thank you, Colorado. I'd like to find this out. Uh, my first guess, Darth Vader. 
But my second guess now, I don't know what my second guess, uh, Hulk Hogan, I guess, would be because uh, this leads to wrestlingnews.co.co, not .com, uh, which I thought was like a British uh, um, domain, and I guess it is, and anybody can buy it. And I guess if the wrestlingnews.com is taken and you want to also have wrestling news, you can do that. I don't think there's any, I hope, I hope the British people aren't into professional wrestling. I don't see why they wouldn't be. Uh, We keep insisting that they'll be interested in American football and and holding games there. And I'm sure to some extent there is some interest there. Eh, Just as there's some people here who are interested in rugby and cricket, but not darts. I don't know. I just wondered about that one or snooker on television. Anyhow, uh, what do we know? Why do we care? Let's find out. Stan Lane. I'm not familiar with Stan Lane, but perhaps wrestling fans are. Stan Lane takes DNA test. Results show that he is not the father of Congresswoman Lauren Boebert. That's news. I don't know. Is it good news? Is it bad news? Was there a question about her parentage? It seems like the sort of thing that a traditional American family values kind of person or someone who's lying about loving traditional American family values because that's what it says to say in the candidate in a box box would be less than excited to spread the news that she had perhaps little to no idea who her father was. Anyway, let's find out what's going on here. It was announced today, today being, I don't know, yesterday, maybe, I don't know. Probably wasn't announced today, but okay. It was announced today when they wrote this thing. Ah, there's the date. On June 3rd, uh, via press release that Stan Lane from the legendary tag team, the Midnight Express, hello, legendary, took a DNA test to prove that he is not the father of Congresswoman, well, it says Congressman, Lauren Boebert. And I don't know, maybe this is a... Whatever, never mind, we won't go into that. The rumor had been out for years and Lane decided to debunk them once and for all. Here is the press release via PW Insider, which, I don't know, Professional Wrestling Insider, probably. Um, Wow, I mean, I didn't realize that this rumor had been flying for years and I don't see why there should be such a rumor. But there it is. It says, my name is Sal Corrente which is not true at all. Um, That's not my name. Um, But this person said that he is a longtime friend and associate of Stan Lane, the former professional wrestler. I am, he says, fully authorized to release the below statement. This is the only statement that will be made by Stan Lane. He will not address any phone calls, texts, or emails on the subject. Carrier pigeon, uh, nothing. Secret code, Morse code transmissions, telegrams, no. No, stop trying. If you need any validation for this, you can contact me directly. Uh, and he gives an email address. If you want to contact Sal Corrente, it's salcorrente at gmail.com. Figure out the spelling. That'll be uh, your challenge for the day. The The statement says, my name is Stan Lane. I have two professional careers, one in the world of professional wrestling and the other as an announcer for many years in powerboat racing. Wow. You know, it's good. That's part of, the, I guess, the many thousands of jobs created by uh, the uh, Biden administration. You can now work announcing powerboat races. Eh, all right. I mean, great. Early in my wrestling career while I was living in Florida and working for Championship Wrestling from Florida, I received notice that a woman I had a short affair with was accusing me of fathering her child. When you went through the legal system and completed a court-ordered paternity test, I was declared not to be the father, and the case was dismissed. In spite of the court verdict, the mother of her, this child, who turned out to be you know, the mother of the child, the child being Congresswoman Lauren Boebert, not the mother, her mother has continued to stick to her original claim, which seems weird, you know, all around. I agreed to take another DNA paternity test with Lauren Boebert in May 2023. I allowed Lauren to handle the chain of custody for the samples, i.e. to alleviate any doubt with the results. I mean, uh, I mean, I hope it was like a blood test or saliva test or something like that. Just never mind the implications of all of this. The results came back on May 11th, 2023. They were conclusive. 
that I had a 0.0% chance to be the biological father. Good for you. That's lucky. Once we both reviewed the results, Lauren and I agreed that this matter is settled, and I accepted Lauren's apology on behalf of herself and her mother. This situation and the numerous false claims made against me over the years has been stressful for me and my family. I feel my otherwise good reputation has been tarnished considerably. I and other close members of my inner circle have been dragged into this as well. I have also been followed by the news media so that they could get the scoop on the topic. I ask that I be taken out of this equation since a conclusive result has been given to both sides. Both sides. While I was fortunate to have a career in the spotlight for 30 plus years, it is my desire to step back and enjoy my retirement with my wife. <laughs> it becomes more difficult, I guess, if you have a bunch of kids out there. I mean, there may also be other kids out there, but it's not Lauren Boebert. Anyway, it's it's uh, it's Marjorie Trader Green. How do you like that? Uh, Matt Gates is your son. My interactions with Miss Boebert have been pleasant and enjoyable. I wish Lauren all the best in her future endeavors. I don't. If she continues to search for her biological father, I hope she finds the answer she's been looking for. And then it's signed Stan Lane. And that's it, it for the day on this story, except I guess Lauren Boebert doesn't know who her father is. And, you know, maybe that drives her interest in traditional values. I, you know, the f traditional family structure was denied to me. Um, uh, that makes me sad. I want to, I don't know, use the power of the government to force everybody into traditional families the way I wish I had been in a traditional family but wasn't. And now look at me. I'm a kook and I don't want more kooks, I guess. But she does want more kooks. So I don't really know what's going on. But anyway, there's this story. There is a picture of Lauren Boebert. It's a split screen here. Lauren Boebert on uh, the left. And then Two wrestlers, who I uh, these guys I assume are the wrestlers, dressed up in wacky costumes, uh, wearing uh, what I assume at the time were fantastic mullets, and uh, separated by a guy I guess is their manager because he's large uh, like they are, but not quite as big, and wearing a suit. I don't know which one of them is Stan Lane, though. Uh, although now, it, if I look closer, it looks like they might be holding plaques of some kind and this one is more clearly readable that says Sean Lane or the other or the other one um may also say that Stan Lane sorry uh, it looks like Sean because it's a terrible picture anyway there you go thanks Matthew for helping us clear that one up i didn't even realize that was a possibility but it's exciting to start the day that way if you ask me now on to more serious topics about other wrestlers who aren't the fathers of any members of Congress, let alone the Freedom Caucus members. Uh, there's a lot. Uh, why don't I jump back? This is how we'll do it today. I'll jump back and read the end of something we started yesterday, because then we ran out of time, the ProPublica piece that was sort of explaining, it was one in it going to be a series of articles by ProPublica, apparently examining how people who came to be involved in uh, various, uh, uh, I guess, Q-adjacent wackiness schemes uh, ended up flipping out. What was it that did it to them? Or at least uh, uh, tracing their trajectory, even if it doesn't find a cause for their losing their marbles. Uh, Nicole Carr had written this one up about, we were reading yesterday about uh, who's uh, Eric Jensen, a parent in North Carolina, who for some reason became convinced that his school board was pushing, remember, transgender BS, and he decided to show up at the school board meeting and level his accusations. And it was sort of, Interesting and a little bit sad and a little weird and concerning uh, just what the trajectory was. And and just that generally he was pushing these claims in ways that he didn't understand were recognized by others as threats, as uh, dangers to the safety of members of the school board and others around him. In other words... Uh, he he thought he, for instance, had a mountain of evidence that proved his crazy theories about how 
the this North Carolina school board was allowing books to be used in the schools that were turning kids gay, but also maybe giving them COVID and making them want them to wear masks, etc. All all the various whichever complaint will stick to the wall if we throw it, you know, toss it into the salad here. And uh, so he showed up with what he thought was a mountain of evidence, but he came with it in a big box and he just sat and he entered the room and sat down and stared menacingly, I guess, at the school board members with this box on his lap. And everybody became concerned what the F is in that box. And then they called the police and you end up with a, you know, he's a, he's a sovereign citizen ish kind of person being driven by crazy conspiracy theories that sound legally you know, uh, legal ish when they are explained to him because he doesn't, you know, really know what, uh, you know, how the legal system works or how anything works. And you say the constitution says you got freedom and they're telling you, you can't sit here with this unidentified greasy looking box on your lap. That's a violation of my freedom. So therefore something, something, and I'm going to sue you and I'm going to get my freedom back. And also all of you are not really legitimate members of, the school board, you're actually corporate numbers owned by the Rothschild family. Okay. Yeah, sure, pal. But this is happening a lot all over the place. So where we left off yesterday, we had read that, uh, well, let's see, we'll skip back down to this part and, and, and give the background of how he got involved in all of this nonsense. Jensen, we had read yesterday, didn't come up with the idea to target the school board on his own. He'd volunteered to help two women connected to the state chapter of a national group that was rapidly gaining followers through social media sites and YouTube channels promoting the convoluted QAnon conspiracy theory. That one was the people who decided, uh, well, in addition to uh, fighting the school board over all the usual suspects that we hear from all the, all the conspiracy theorists, uh, Books that teach kids, convert kids to gay and masks are bad and so's the COVID-19 vaccine, all that kind of garbage. Right. Well, it turns out they latched on to the, oh, you know, a uh, sovereign citizen adjacent theory uh, under which they could, they were entitled to standing, which they're not, to sue the school board's insurers and force the insurers to stop covering the school board for their activities and uh, it's not a real thing but they became convinced it was a real thing but they also believe you know that their identities have been stolen by corporate entities and they've been re-registered their names have been re-registered and uh, their corporate entities rather than you remember all the crazy uh Sovereign citizen ideas. Anyway, Jensen, a solid gray haired man with piercing blue eyes, retired about five years ago, although his wife still works as a custodian at the elementary school and maybe her job's in trouble now that the uh, school board knows that she's married to a kook uh, who shows up and menaces the board. But who knows? He'd been a project manager for a metal building manufacturer that transferred him to North Carolina from Ohio. Remember that prior to that, he and his family owned a campground for three decades he described how several years ago he made the decision to abandon mainstream media. He said it used to be that I was always watching the news, but once I found out how much they lie, you have to get back into alternative media to find out the actual truth. He's a big uh, fan of the JFK is alive and Hillary Clinton are and Bill Gates are dead theories that the COVID-19 is actually a death shot, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. So he's got all of these crazy ideas. Oh, plus, of course, the idea that uh, the corporations that make the, the COVID-19 test are actually using it to patent and own your DNA somehow. And that everybody's going to be uh, rounded up and killed and buried in plastic caskets that he's sure are lined up by the millions in, I don't know, parking lots around the country for some reason. Uh, those are cars, not plastic caskets, although they're very similar in some ways to plastic caskets. Anyway, uh, okay, so now he hooks up over Telegram with North Carolina bonds for the win. We're going to sue over the surety bonds, which sometimes yes and sometimes no still exist for school boards. And then 
thereby win, right? So now he's to accomplish its goal. Uh, the followers would serve local school boards with reams of paperwork outlining an intent to sue their district's surety bonds or risk management plan providers. The movement dubbed Paper Terrorism by the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Anti-Defamation League aims to force school districts into compliance to avoid losing federal funding, which is not really in the offing. But the tactic was well, already being tested in North Carolina's largest school district, where earlier that January, a mother had crossed the security barrier to serve the Wake County School Board with papers warning, you violated your oath of office. One of the other famed, uh, favorite uh, attacks that they say, you know, I, I'm arresting you for treason. You violated your oath of office. You said you would stand up for something, something and honor the Constitution. And you didn't because I say you didn't. And so therefore you should be arrested. That's the basis of these claims. And then he says, Jensen says, and that's when I found these ladies, Jensen said, of the two women leading efforts in his school district for North Carolina bonds for the win. All right. Upcoming is our first break. By that point, by the time we exit for that, I think we'll be caught up to where we left off. Remember, though, that on in February of 2022, Jensen arrived at the lobby of the Winston-Salem Forsyth County School Board meeting and met the women in person for the first time, Deborah Tuttle and Regina Garner, right? They handed him this cardboard box of paperwork, the problematic box that we heard about before, which he understood to be explanations about how they, the district school officials, were going to get sued against their bonds for teaching critical race theory. And also, of course, allowing books containing profanity in the schools. He also said the documents included proof that masks don't work because they figure, why not throw it in the box, too? So they show up. Garner and Tuttle sign up to speak, and he finds himself planted in there with that weird box. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time. Just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad. Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction and Whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure, recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't, do it without you. Hope you'll be on board soon too. Thanks for all your support. All right, welcome back now to the K-Girl in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. All right, so I think we're back, more or less back where we left off yesterday. We had uh, now introduced um, the two women, Deborah Tuttle and Regina Gard Garner, into the picture where uh, Eric Jensen now finds himself meeting them at the school board building. And they hand him this box full of evidence and they all three, I guess, head into the room. Just minutes into the meeting, a school board chairperson watched with curiosity and a dose of trepidation as a man with a huge box took a seat a few rows back. She texted the board members sitting next to her, alerting them to the man. They too wanted to know what was in that box. He was just staring at us, and we were a little worried for our safety, Chairperson Deanna Kaplan recalled. Both Garner and Tuttle signed up to address the board during the public comment period. Garner complained about the district's failure to uphold the Constitution and accused school officials of practicing medicine without a license and violating child abuse laws, I guess over masking. Then Tuttle stepped up. There's a lot more violations that she didn't get into, but you can read those for yourself when we serve you your letters of intent. 
she told the board. As the women spoke, Kaplan grew more uneasy about the man with the box. Then, she said, he started charging at us. Remember this, and we were worried about that. As Jensen, clutching the box, neared the superintendent, school security officers grabbed him and pulled him out of the meeting room. In the adjacent hallway, he strained against the three men it took to hold him down. You work for me, Jensen repeatedly yelled as security guards tried to shackle his wrists and ankles. That's another of the fun common conceits of these things. You can't arrest me. You work for me. Well, you know, they're public employees and you're a member of the public, but they don't work for you. They work for the public at large. You're one drop in the bucket of the public and uh, they don't, you know, it's just not the way things really work. But they, you know, that's their interpretation of things. You work for me. We the people. We the people. It says we the people in the beginning of the preamble, the non-binding preamble to the Constitution. And I'm a person. And so, yeah, it doesn't work that way. And go to school. Anyhow, uh, he wasn't the only one screaming at the time. His deep voice echoed from the hallway into the meeting room where some attendees began screaming and board members sat in disbelief as they watched the mounting chaos. The board hastily called for an impromptu recess, as they should, to try and figure things out and get safe. Meanwhile, of course, uh, that's interpreted as hiding from the public. And so what do you yell at people who take an impromptu recess? Commie cowards or commie bitch. That's what you do if you're a crazy lunatic. Uh, and then, of course, the more uh, low key but still crazy. If you walk out, you're walking away from your job. That was Tuttle yelling from the pro podium. There was somebody in the audience that was yelling, the Patriots are coming. I mean, it was a zoo. It was crazy. Kaplan recalled the board members were concerned for our safety. Next up, two months after his arrest, Jensen came to court prepared to represent himself, of course, on misdemeanor counts of trespass and resisting a public officer. He said he carried a folder with some notes he'd made and a printout of the Constitution, in case the court hadn't heard of it, I guess. As the judge entered the courtroom, Jensen said he proudly refused to comply with the order, all rise. Why? Because I'm, you know, you're, 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 the judge is a corporate number who's owned by the Rothschild family. Sure, whatever. Well, his real theory apparently is, I'm not going to rise for all rise. Why? That puts the judge above you, Jensen later explained. Well, he is above you in the courtroom. It's the, the, he's presiding over your trial. But okay, that puts the judge above you. And that judge is not above you. He's below you. Or she's below you. Why is she below you? She's not. Well, you, you work for me. That's the theory that's going on here, right? You're a public employee. You work for me. You should rise when I enter. Well, that's a theory, too. We could build a society that way, and it might even work. Uh, but uh, we didn't. So anyway, Jensen said his refusal to stand angered the bailiff. That's interesting, too. I mean... They they like the routine. It's not actually necessary to the, you know, carrying out of justice properly for the person to stand because the judge came in the room. It's tradition. It's decorum, etc. But uh, and you could see why it would make the bailiff mad. And I was thinking, you know, well, you know, maybe you have better things to be mad about. But, you know, it's analogous to I mean, nobody says this. Apparent, well, we say it too. And no, nobody in the serious media says anything to Republican politicians when they get mad that people won't stand to salute the flag. Or if they take a knee during the national anthem, that's an outrage and they should be, you know, murdered. But let this guy not stand up when the judge comes in. Well, I don't know. He's a patriot, so I guess it's okay. I don't know. I find that a little bit weird. He's not the flag. He's just a judge. Uh, and we hate that judge. And maybe he's even Mexican. We don't know. Anyway, so there you go. That's that's the level he's working on. So anyway, as it turns out, that doesn't work very well in front of the judge and things go poorly. But not because he didn't stand, but because he's a lunatic with no case. Jensen said his refusal to stand angered the bailiff. That's probably true. He also said that before he could even open his folder of evidence, the judge dismissed his case. Court records show Jensen received a voluntary dismissal. 
Now, that could all be a big conspiracy. He didn't receive a voluntary dismissal. He didn't agree to have his case dismissed. It was dismissed against his will, and they wrote down that it was voluntary so that he would have no case on appeal, or else he didn't understand what it was he was agreeing to, or I don't know what. But uh, before he could even open his folder, and that's not a right. It doesn't say, show me in the Constitution where it says you're allowed to open a folder. Huh? Huh? Right. Well, now you're trapped by your own stupid theory. So anyhow, he uh, apparently gets a voluntary dismissal. Prosecutors have not responded to requests for comment about how that happened, I guess. A court clerk said that the slew of misdemeanor dismissals that day may have resulted from the court's attempt to clear a pandemic backlog. But, you know, you file your pleadings with the judge. The judge comes out and says, this is gobbledygook. I'm dismissing this case because... You're representing yourself. I understand why you're trying to do that. It's not wise. You shouldn't do that. You have the right to do it anyway. But the pleadings you submitted are garbage. I'll tell you what. I'll give you a, a voluntary dismissal and uh, without prejudice and I'll allow you to refile. Go get a lawyer and refile may have been what happened here. Uh, it doesn't really clear that up. But regarding the judge and the courthouse staff, Jensen said, I didn't allow them to boss me around. As for the security guards who arrested him, he said he's now considering filing assault charges against one of them because he grabbed me and threw me down for no reason, except that they thought you were a terrorist who might have had a bomb. And if you were brown and you had witnessed it as a white person and were worried that there was a bomb in that box, you would have thought it was awesome. Anyway, he described how, overall, the experience left him feeling empowered though he was disappointed that the movement that inspired his efforts had fizzled. Now, before we move on to that, I also thought it would have been an interesting, you know, moment to like uh, open your eyes to what's going on. Like I, I, not only I, I said, if the person with the box on their lap had been brown and you as a white man observer had thought there might be a bomb or a weapon in it, you would have thought that throwing him to the ground was awesome. You probably would have said that so awesome. The only way that this could be even more awesome is if the security guard who threw him to the ground was wearing a, um, what's it, the Punisher patch. That would have been really cool. Or if he had uh, uh, a sticker on his door with a picture of a target that says, uh, if you can read this, you're in range. That that would have made things awesome. Uh, well, you know, what could have been a great moment for him to realize, wow, this is something that happens to black and brown people every day. And they're very angry at the police for doing it. And they even think about suing them. But sometimes instead of suing them, they just don't stand up for the national anthem the way I didn't stand up for the judge. But anyway, the point is the black and brown people who do this stuff are terrorists and thugs and deserve to be uh, beaten into submission. And I am a white patriot. And this is all an egregious violation of my constitutional rights as a result. But he didn't get that message. Instead, he got the message that everybody else is wrong and they're all against me and I'm right. But he's also now mad at the people who gave him the box, as it turns out, right? Why? The ladies that I was with, they remember, we just transitioned into this. He described how the experience left him feeling empowered. Another backwards reaction, right? Most times, uh, and maybe, maybe there's a lesson here for other activists, people of color, who, I don't know how you get around to feeling empowered by being abused by police and security forces, but he found a way to feel empowered about it. Um, but but I guess he feels empowered about it because he, nothing really bad happened to him. He got beat up by the cops, but then they kind of let him go. There were some misdemeanor charges. They end up basically getting dropped, I think is the whole premise of this article, whereas they might not be dropped against people of color, and so they wouldn't end up feeling empowered. But I guess if you were told by the state, that you had done something wrong, and that was the reason you were thrown to the ground. But then the state decided, nah, forget it. Either you may have done something wrong, you may not have. But the point is, we're not prosecuting you for it. Then you would feel empowered. But of course, if you get the book thrown at you, as happens very frequently to other people, you might not come away feeling empowered. But the next section is about, not so much about the feeling of empowerment, as his disappointment that the movement that inspired his efforts had fizzled. How so? The ladies that I was with, they pretty much dropped it, he said, adding that their decision kind of threw me because they weren't going to fight for it. Garner ended up running for a seat on the school board, but she was unsuccessful. Basically, they went to this hearing 
they were going to totally blow the lid off of this unconstitutional conspiracy to something, something. And uh, they were going to use the bonds for the win. And the school board instead said, who are these weirdos? Let's have them arrested and tossed out of here. And the guy who they enlisted to carry the box got roughed up and charged with trespassing and uh, resisting an officer of some kind. Um, The other two, I don't know whether they faced any charges, but they basically said, eh, forget it. Now, remember, the Constitution itself was under threat here. They were, you know, there there was a a threat to the American way of life. And uh, as soon as the cops arrived, uh, the two women who gave the guy the box that got him in trouble said, meh. We're not that interested anymore. So I guess they were lying the whole time about that. And that, as he says, kind of threw me. Now, again, he still doesn't really wake up to, hey, maybe I have stepped into the twilight zone here and everybody I'm dealing with is an idiot. And that may lead me to the conclusion that I was really dreading that I, too, am an idiot or have misunderstood everything uh, or... Or it could be that everyone's against me, even the people I adopted as allies last week. And uh, that's usually where these kind of people land, unfortunately. And there it is. So Jensen did face one consequence. He said he was banned from school property for any purpose other than to pick up and drop off his children. But that's it, he said, which is, it ain't great. Now, a spokesperson for the Winston-Salem Forsyth County School District confirmed the ban, but declined to detail the terms of it, citing legal concerns. He said the bans typically last a year. In general, the letter outlines situations when principals can grant permission for the person to come on campus. They, however, must ask and be granted that permission by school administrators. Jensen admitted during the conversation in November that he hasn't exactly complied with the ban, When he showed up for his youngest daughter's elementary school graduation last spring, and remember that's not picking up or dropping off necessarily, a neighbor called school security on him. But he said school officials let him stay. They wanted to defuse the situation. But to him, that was them admitting that they were unconstitutionally wrong. What were they actually doing here? The district spokesperson said Jensen was allowed to attend the graduation in an effort to reduce stress and embarrassment for his student and on the condition that he maintained appropriate behavior. Jensen also said that he's not worried about what would happen if he violated the ban again. The message he took was you don't have to pay attention to the ban because he's crazy and he doesn't understand things. And so he now believes they're really realizing that their whole a plot to destroy me, a sovereign citizen, won't hold up in a real constitutional court, so they're not enforcing the ban. When they're really like, we don't want to make a scene, it's a graduation. If he behaves himself, let him see his daughter graduate, and then he'll get the hell out of here. And you know, she'll be done. We won't have to deal with him showing up on our property anymore. But he's sure that was a constitutional adjudication. Anyway, he's since declined to speak further about his experiences or be photographed for this story. One of these days, he says, I'm tempted to just walk in and allow them to throw me out or arrest me or whatever because they have no right to do it, Jensen said, not long before closing his door. So we'll see what shakes out if I do, which is a fantastic way to end. He's learned zero lessons and has basically said, I may, although I now have no reason to go to this elementary school because my last child, my youngest child, has graduated from this elementary school. There's a standing order that says I'm not allowed to go there, but I believe it's unconstitutional, so I'm going to go there and test it. And if they throw me out, boy, howdy, I'm going to have a field day because when I bring the Constitution in a folder this time, a judge will totally let me open it up. I'll bring it out, and he'll say, you're right, Constitution, I'm executing the school board. That's what's going to happen. And I'm not certain, though, but what if they don't? What if the judge is lenient? What if the judge is a Mexican? I may have to execute the school board myself. Well, anyway, the point is, I'm sure, going on and said, he didn't say this. He did not say this, but I'm now speculating because it would be irresponsible not to. Is this the kind of person who says, well, you know that by rights, we should be able to at least arrest the school board. The judge probably won't do it because he's a softy leftist communist Mexican. 
So I may have to affect a citizen's arrest myself. And you know how it is when you're affecting arrest, you got to bring a gun. So I'm going to go to the school. I'm going to go to the local elementary school with a gun, maybe an AR-15. And I'm going to go in there and I have a right to be there. Now they're going to say I don't. And they're going to say that carrying the gun threatens the safety of the children and teachers and uh, at the school. And they're going to try to have security arrest me. But I'm not there to shoot anybody. I know that. And they... They maybe they don't, but that's not my problem. What they know and don't know. I'm there to be a peaceful citizen patriot and to affect my citizens arrest. So I'm going to go with that gun and they're going to throw me out and they're going to throw me out because it's un, you know, they love being unconstitutional. It has nothing to do with the gun. I have the right to have the gun. The state law says I have the right to have a gun. The Constitution says I have a right to have that gun. And that's a public school. They work for me. You know, you can see. This guy is essentially saying, yeah, I'm going to show up and I'm going to look every inch like a maniac school shooter. And when they react to that, then they'll have stepped into my constitutional trap and I'll have them at long last. These are the kinds of people we're dealing with. And the, the rest of them, the, they, their allies, Republican allies in, the, in Congress are furious with the Department of Justice and Merrick Garland for identifying these people as a threat and saying, well, maybe they are almost terrorists in the sense that they're going, they're planning to show up at meetings, at schools with guns, with unidentified boxes full of weird crap and say, the Constitution allows me to do this. We the people, you work for me. And that's worrisome. They say we're terrorists. Well, I'm saying when you say that you're going to show up at places and you, I dare you to throw me out and maybe I also have the right to be there with a gun, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is not, this is not a stretch. They are doing these things. This guy hasn't done this, but supposing he were to do it, he would be insisting the whole time that it was all a case of a misunderstanding. He's a patriot, not a terrorist. Can't you see the difference? Hmm. Well, I wonder. Anyway, uh, now I'm sort of curious about whether or not any more of these types of uh, profiles have been published. But I thought it was just sort of interesting to get a sense of where sometimes these guys are coming from. And you should be wary of it because they're crazy and it's difficult to uh, fathom to say the least. Now, uh, in a slight shift, I wanted to read from Tech Dirt, uh, from uh, who's writing this here? Is, where's my, uh, there we are, Mike Masnick, who examines a couple of other crazy people's rantings, except these are famous rich white people who are ranting. And so therefore they are only, as Greg will tell you, eccentric as opposed to just plain uh, street corner crazy. But I don't know. I, I'm following this up with this article because I see a lot of similarities between this and what else is going on, even when they have lawyers. Uh, what am I talking about? Totally different subject, sort of, except maybe the same. Twitter admits in court filing... This headline says, Elon Musk is simply wrong about government interference at Twitter. Another guy who just totally, you know, probably willfully misunderstands everything about the Constitution. And it's a widespread misunderstanding. You know, I got uh, somebody yelled at me on Twitter. That's a violation of my First Amendment rights. No, it's not. We've been through this. You know it already. You don't need me to explain it. But here we are. Um, and here we are in high stakes where people who have lawyers and everything are still making the same problems. And the lawyers, uh, so eventually you wonder, well, what makes a lawyer take a case like this and what do they do with it? And I guess this is the answer. So this is the way Mike Masnick puts it in Tech Dirt. It's amazing the degree to which some people will engage in confirmation bias and believe absolute nonsense, even as the facts show the opposite is true. And there, it's easy to see the parallel with Eric Jensen over here. Over the past few months, we've gone through the various Twitter files releases. 
Yes. And pointed out over and over and over again how the explanations people gave for them simply don't match up with the underlying documents. We've read a little bit about that. But you know what we're talking about, the Twitter files thing, right? To date, not a single document revealed has shown what people now falsely believe, that the U.S. government and Twitter were working together to, quote, censor people based on their political viewpoints. Literally none of that has been shown at all. Instead, what's been shown is that Twitter had a competent trust and safety team that debated tough questions around how to apply policies for users on their platform and did not seem at all politically motivated in their decisions. Furthermore, while various government entities sometimes did communicate with the company, there's little evidence of any attempt by government officials to compel Twitter to moderate in any particular way. And Twitter staff regularly and repeatedly rebuffed any attempt by government officials to go after certain users or content. We know that they were asked to because the Trump administration asked them to. Anyway, now, as you may recall, two years ago, a few months after Donald Trump was banned from Twitter, Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter, Facebook and YouTube, he sued the companies, and he sues everybody, claiming that the banning violated the First Amendment. Another dumb misunderstanding. But he, you know, he's got money and he can pay lawyers to go into the court and say, well, he can pay people outside of court to say they're going to go into court and argue the First Amendment implications. But the point of this article is when they get to court, they realize I'll actually be in trouble if I argue this is a First Amendment case, probably. So I'm going to argue it as something else. And that's news. We should hear about that. Well, anyway, he says he's going to sue the companies claiming that they that the banning violated the First Amendment. This was hilariously stupid for many reasons, not the least of which is because at the time of the banning, Donald Trump was president of the United States and these companies were very much private entities. The First Amendment, of course, restricts the government, not private entities, and it absolutely does not restrict private companies from banning the President of the United States, or anybody else for that matter, should the President violate a site's rules, as expected. The case went poorly for Trump, leading to it being dismissed, not like, uh, not unlike Eric Jensen and his stupid case. It is currently on appeal. However, in early May, Trump's lawyers filed a motion to effectively try to reopen the case at the district court, arguing that the Twitter files changed everything and that now there was proof that Trump's First Amendment rights were violated. There can't be proof of that, of course, because there's no way for a private entity to violate First Amendment rights like that. But now I have a box and I'm carrying it into the courtroom. So therefore, duh, I win, right? I have a box. Uh, okay. And here's an ex a, uh, excerpt from what? I don't know. Probably from the court documents. In October of 2022, after the entry of this court's judgment, Twitter was acquired by Elon Musk. Shortly thereafter, this is, I guess, Trump's appeal filing. Shortly thereafter, Mr. Musk invited several journalists to review Twitter's internal records, allowing these journalists to search for evidence that Twitter censored content that was otherwise compliant with Twitter's terms of service, or TOS, right? The journalists disclosed their findings in a series of posts on Twitter, collectively known as the Twitter Files. That's not really what the Twitter files were, but okay. As set out in the attached Rule 60 motion, the Twitter files confirm plaintiffs' allegations that Twitter engaged in a widespread censorship campaign that not only violated the TOS, but as much of the censorship was the result of unlawful government influence, violated the First Amendment. That's the theory, I guess for the First Amendment claims. Because they were doing it at the behest of the government, the government was leaning on Twitter to violate free speech rights that citizens had. And so it wasn't Twitter acting. It was really the government that was forcing Twitter to act. And so therefore, First Amendment. Okay. No, but now we understand where you're coming from. Uh, you're wrong, but we understand where you're coming from. I had been thinking... Our writer says about writing this up as a story, but things got busy. And last week, Twitter, which again is now owned by Elon Musk, who has repeatedly made ridiculous, misleading statements about what the Twitter files showed. They've now filed its re their response. Twitter has where they say with the risk of sanctions on the line that this is all BS. 
And nothing in the Twitter files says what Trump and Elon and a bunch of his fans claim it says. This is pretty effing damning to anyone who believed the nonsense Twitter files narrative. The lawyers now in court realize we're under threat of sanctions if we actually go forward with this claim. So we got to come up with something else. So here's what we got. The new materials do not plausibly suggest that Twitter suspended any of plaintiff's accounts pursuant to any state-created right or rule of conduct. As this court held, Lugar's first prong, the Lugar test, a, a previous case, presidential case, the first prong of the test outlined there requires a clear government-imposed rule. But as with plaintiff's amended complaint, the new materials contain only a grab bag of communications about varied topics, none establishing a state-imposed rule responsible for plaintiff's challenged content moderation decisions. The new materials cover topics ranging, for example, from Hunter Biden's laptop to foreign interference to techniques used in malware and ransomware attacks. As with the allegations in the amended complaint, it is not plausible to conclude that Twitter or any other listener could discern a clear state rule from such varied communications. The new materials would not change this court's dismissal of plaintiff's First Amendment claims for this reason alone. These are Twitter's lawyers, who I guess presumably are also now Elon Musk's lawyers, uh, and kind of in order in order to defend the suit and not lose millions of dollars to, in payments to Donald Trump, have to defend the correct position that no Donald Trump's banning from Twitter didn't violate any First Amendment principles or anything else. I mean, it's interesting because Elon Musk kind of wants the opposite to be proved, but it's going to cost Twitter. I presumably would cost. Twitter millions of dollars if they allowed Trump to run around and say he was right and then hope for him to win the case. Anyway, moreover, a rule of conduct is imposed by the state only if backed by the force of law as with a statute or regulation. Here, nothing in the new material suggests any statute or regulation dictating or authorizing Twitter's content moderation decisions with respect to plaintiff's accounts. On the contrary, the new materials show... What? Uh, oh, here comes the music. The new materials show that Twitter takes content moderation actions pursuant to its own rules and policies. Well, duh, of course it does. As attested to by FBI agent Elvis Chan, that's a name, when the FBI reported content to social media companies, they would alert the social media companies to see if the content violated their terms of service. And the social media companies would then follow their own policies regarding what actions to take. It wasn't the FBI closing anyone down, despite whatever kooky charges you might make up. All right, welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Edwards Radio. Let's hurry up and uh, continue on with this. Because, uh, gosh, it's uh, annoying and weird. But, okay, we left off in the middle of the, uh, I guess, Twitter's actual pleadings in the case, which is weird because they stand in an odd place given that their new ownership really wants the company to be held liable for violating Donald Trump's First Amendment rights, which they didn't do and would cost the company millions of dollars, presumably. But, um, you know, and, and you might wonder whether Elon Musk is doing his fiduciary duty to the company. But remember that it appears with, you know, greater clarity every day that he bought the company to destroy it, which is uh, actually makes an interesting analog to Donald Trump's own administration of the federal government. Right. I, I ran for president essentially. Uh, well, under the guidance of my weirdo guru, um, what's his name, Steve Bannon, to, you know, what, what did he say? Destroy the administrative state, which, okay, like, uh, as elected, as, you know, duly elected, if he was, in fact, duly elected president of the United States, it's my prerogative, I guess, to do everything I can to undermine the administration of the state in the hopes of dismantling it. Now, there's no constitutional, uh, uh, clause that empowers the president to dismantle the governmental structure. You know, he's got certain latitudes, but presumably he's kind of stuck with the three branch construction 
of the Constitution. And although you can just, I mean, I guess if you can get the Supreme Court to agree, you could agree that the the Constitution means anything and you could deconstruct the administrative state, whatever that means, that way. But, you know, uh, the the issue here is, like with Elon Musk, does he have a fiduciary duty to the shareholders to maximize their profits and uh, rate of return for the shares that they hold? Or can he, as CEO, does he have the right to, you know, say, oh, uh, well, I really want to do the right thing, whatever I think that is. And that includes uh, admitting to these violations in court such that Twitter has to pay millions of dollars to Donald Trump, but I don't care because I'm a billionaire and it's no skin off my nose. The rest of you lose your investments. I'm going to lose billions, but I have billions left anyway. And my purpose, for whatever reason, was to come and destroy this company. But you all thought that my fiduciary duty was to actually, you know, strengthen the company and protect shareholder value and shareholder interest. I've been, uh, as a, you know, died in a wool capitalist, telling everybody that that's what my responsibility was. But I have a greater responsibility because cosmic reasons that only I understand that actually lead me to want to destroy the thing. But that's my right. Uh, you hired me to run this company as I see fit. I made a business decision to destroy it. And that's that. You know, again, gray area, uh, immovable object, irresistible force. Uh, President of the United States swears to uphold the Constitution, but says, but I think the Constitution means something other than what you think it means. I might be able to get five people in robes to agree that that's the case. If they're the right five, I'm right. And yes, I will dismantle the Constitution, um, effect political union with Russia to own the globalists. And you'll all say, uh, seems weird, but he is president. And I guess that's that. Uh, it's, you know, same, I don't know, to me, analogous situation that, uh, no, you shouldn't be able to do that because there's countervailing, you know, rights and responsibilities. Yeah, but then also, uh, I don't know, superpowers. So I guess uh, I'm right. No, yeah, you're actually wrong. Well, uh, five kooky Supreme Court justices say I'm right. Shoot. What are we going to do about that? Hmm. Well, anyway, where do we leave off? Right. Oh, yes. So uh, in the pleadings, we find this important phrase right here. There is nothing in the new materials, the Twitter files, so-called Twitter files, which they misidentify. Uh, suggests that any statute or regulation dictating or authorizing Twitter's content moderation decisions with respect to plaintiff's accounts. To the contrary, the new materials show that Twitter takes content moderation actions pursuant to its own rules and policies. The FBI agent Elvis Chan says essentially, yeah, when we see something that's of concern, we flag it and tell a social media company and then see if it violates their terms of service. And if so, that takes care of the problem. But the FBI doesn't tell them what to do. It just says, here's something I think is problematic. What do you think? If they agree, great. So, uh, yes, the social media companies are following their own policies regarding what actions to take, if any. And general calls from, say, the Biden administration for Twitter and other social media companies to, quote, do more, unquote, to address alleged misinformation fails to suggest a state-imposed rule of conduct for the same reasons this court already held the amended complaint's allegations insufficient. That is, to wit, I guess, the comments of a handful of elected officials are a far cry from a rule of decision for which the state is responsible and do not impose any clear rule, let alone one with the force of law. The new materials thus would not change this court's determination that plaintiffs have not alleged any deprivation caused by a rule of conduct imposed by the state. Again, what they're saying here to decode it is that Trump's theory, which is stupid and wrong, is that, well, what if a congressman says Twitter should do more to regulate uh, hate speech or... Um, uh, conspiracy theories about vaccines or voting or whatever, whatever the theory happens to be this week. What if the president, President Joe Biden, says that they should do more and then they do more? Isn't that government action and so therefore a violation of the First Amendment? And the courts say, no, 
when you look at it and you sit right down and you figure out, okay, should even when the president of the United States says you should do more and then they do more, isn't that state action? No, it's a suggestion. State action involves something legally binding. There's nothing legally binding here. The, 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 the Congress speaks through legislation. There's no legislation here. The president, to the extent that he's affecting the outcome of laws, speaks in a legally binding way, perhaps, through executive orders. There's no executive order here. It's just somebody saying, you know what, I wish they should do more. They really should. And then they do. That's because they agree and they take a voluntary action. There's no governmental action here. But a government official said it. Yes, well, but at the same time, you're over here uh, involved in court with E. Jean Carroll because you said uh, you didn't rape her because she's not your type. And you were president when you said that. And then you come to that court and argue, oh, this has nothing to do with anything. There's no state action here. Uh, then, interestingly, of course, you say, well, there is state action because I said it when I was president and therefore my defense should be free, paid for by the Department of Justice. So a little bit of everything, a little bit of any kind of uh, defense that you can come up with. What's weird is that the Department of, defense, Department of Justice to, to, to date has actually agreed with that one, which is outrageous. Anyway, back to this case. Later, it goes on further, and I guess we're still back in Twitter's own pleadings here, where Twitter arguing for itself as normal people understand Twitter should be arguing for itself, not under the sway of Elon Musk's stupid, weird mission to destroy Twitter, but Twitter's actual interest in self-preservation. Plaintiffs, Trump, appear to contend that the new materials support an inference of state action in Twitter's suspension of Trump's account because they show that certain Twitter employees initially determined that Trump's January 2021 tweets, for which his account was ultimately suspended, did not violate Twitter's policy against inciting violence. But these materials regarding Twitter's internal deliberations and disagreements show no governmental participation with respect to plaintiff's accounts. The fact that there was internal disagreement is... Just that internal disagreement inside Twitter. Some people say it violates the terms. Other people say they don't. Ultimately, the leadership of Twitter decided we're best off saying that it does. And let's effectuate that policy and ban the account. The fact that some people who are elected representatives or otherwise are officials in the United States government said, well, we think Twitter ought to reach this conclusion has nothing to do with it. Plaintiffs are also wrong that general calls from the Biden administration to address alleged COVID-19 misinformation support a plausible inter inference rather of state action in Twitter's suspensions of a, a couple of other different plaintiffs. Trump wasn't the only plaintiff suspensions of Quadroses and Roots accounts simply because they, quote, had their Twitter accounts suspended or revoked due to COVID-19 content. No implication of state action there either. For one thing, most of the relevant communications date from spring 2021 or later after these other plaintiffs' suspensions in early 2020 and early 2021, respectively. Such communications that post-date the relevant conduct that allegedly injured the plaintiffs do not establish state action. There's some precedent cited for that. Additionally, the new materials contain only general calls on Twitter to do more to address COVID-19 misinformation and questions regarding why Twitter had not taken action against certain other accounts, not the plaintiffs. Such requests to do more to stop the spread of false or misleading COVID-19 information, untethered to any specific threat or requirement to take any specific action against plaintiffs is permissible persuasion and not state action. Precedent cited for that. As this court previously held, government actors are free to urge private parties to take certain actions or criticize others without giving rise to state action, because that is the most that the new materials suggest with respect to these other plaintiffs. The new materials would not change this court's dismissal of their claims. Twitter's filing is like a beat-by-beat -beat debunking of the conspiracy theories pushed by the dude who owns Twitter. It's really quite incredible. And then some more quotation from the 
uh, pleadings. First, the simple act of receiving information from the government or of deciding to act upon that information does not transform a private actor into a state actor. Twitter's uh, review posts that potentially violated the company's content moderation policy were not state action. While plaintiffs have attempted to distinguish the O'Handley case, uh, precedent cited above, on the basis of the repeated communications reflected in the new materials, O'Handley, that case, held that such flags do not suggest state action even where done on a repeated basis through a dedicated priority portal. In other words, like if the FBI has a priority portal to discuss with Twitter, uh, content that they see as possibly dangerous for some reason, uh, uh, on their normal beat, but also something that could fall subject to Twitter's terms of service. And they, even if they maintain an open channel specifically for that purpose and report the guy a hundred times, that doesn't actually turn it into state action. It's all just a large number of suggestions. Although you could see where it becomes uh, an issue where I guess you could at least argue, I don't know whether courts would buy it or not, where the repeated suggestion that something happen could turn into a threat. And you could see it easily happening, say, under the Trump administration. All right, you don't want to take our suggestions, our hundreds of suggestions that my political enemy should be banned. Hmm, well, uh, time for some trouble at the FTC for Twitter, right? You know, to use the uh, uh, Chris Christie construction of things, you know, and, and one of Donald Trump's favorite things. You use, you leverage the power of some other part of the government to menace the people who won't do your bidding. Now you're talking. But since that wasn't happening, you're not talking. That's that's the only other conclusion you can reach. Anyway, they continue on. The very documents on which the plaintiffs rely establish that when governmental actors reported to social media companies content that potentially violated the terms of service, the companies, including Twitter, would see if the content violated their terms of service. And if it did, they would follow their own policies, their own policies regarding what content moderation action was appropriate. The FBI, uh, there's some uh, testimony that uh, comports with this that they quote here, where an FBI agent says, we at the FBI would send information about malign foreign influence to specific companies as we became aware of it, and then they would review it and determine if they needed to take action. In other words, Twitter made an independent assessment and acted accordingly. Moreover, the frequent meetings on which plaintiffs rely heavily in attempting to show joint action fall even farther short of what was alleged in the O'Handley case because, as discussed, they were wholly unrelated to the kinds of content moderation decisions at issue here. Second, contrary to plaintiff's contention, the fact that the government gave certain Twitter employees security clearance does not transform information sharing into state action. The necessity for security clearance reflects only the, secu- the sensitive nature of the information being shared, i.e., efforts by foreign adversaries to undermine the legitimacy of the 2020 election. It says nothing about whether Twitter would work hand-in-hand with the federal government. Again, when the FBI shared sensitive information regarding possible election interference, Twitter determined whether and how to respond. I guess the attempt here is, well, you gave certain Twitter employees security clearances. Okay, that's a little weird and suspect. Why did it happen? Well, in order to tell them that we have detected outside state actors trying to interfere in the election, how so? I don't see the connection. Well, we have to brief you on something. But in order to brief you on something, we have to give you a security clearance to do it. Now that your security clearance is uh, approved, we can show you here's how we know what the Russians say are doing uh, in an attempt to manipulate uh, uh, beliefs about to undermine confidence in American elections. And this is yet another example of it. Ah, in context, I now see the case. I understand. Thank you for the context and thank you for the security clearance that allowed you to give me that context that I so that I could come to a rational conclusion about the new examples you were bringing to my attention. That's what's happening. Does that make it state action? Uh, arguably closer, but still no, says the court. 
All right. Third, plaintiffs are also wrong that Twitter became a state actor because the FBI paid Twitter millions of dollars for the staff time Twitter expended in handling the government's censorship requests. That's an interesting theory, but apparently, again, no. For one thing, the communications on which plaintiffs rely, in fact, explains that Twitter was reimbursed $3 million pursuant to a statutory right of reimbursement for time spent processing legal process requests. The statutory right at issue is that created under the Stored Communications Act for costs incurred in searching for, assembling, reproducing, or otherwise providing electronic communications requested by the government pursuant to a warrant. The reimbursements were not for responding to requests to remove any accounts or content, and thus are wholly irrelevant to the plaintiff's joint action theory. Another just uh, willful conflation of two different things that were going on. If we serve you with a subpoena and you answer it, we're going to reimburse you for the time it took to answer it. Also, if we see something that looks like Russian interference or undermining the confidence of Americans in elections, we'll tell you and you decide what to do with it. Putting those two things together, I mean, you know, it takes a conspiracy theorist to do it, but here a court sorts it out. You know, uh, it, it can ha it can work where there's no adjudication of the truth of the allegations. And if you can say it on a website in a way that says, A, but also B, C, I get it, aha. Well, no, that one doesn't follow from the other. They're two unrelated things, but I don't understand that to be the case. And there's no judge explaining it to me and telling me, well, all right, even if you don't understand it, the judgment of this court is, no, that's not real. You don't win. All right, continuing and then concluding from the court filing, and in any event, a financial relationship supports joint action only where there is complete financial integration and indispensability, according to precedent cited herein. During the period in which Twitter received the $3 million, it's late 2019 through early 2021, the company was valued at approximately $30 billion. Even plaintiffs do not argue that a $3 million payment would be indispensable to Twitter. Now our writer comes back and chimes in. I mean, if you read Tech Dirt, you already knew about all this because we debunked the nonsense government paid Twitter to censor stories months ago, even as Elon Musk was falsely tweeting exactly that. And now Elon's own lawyers are admitting that the company's owner is completely full of crap not the crap word, or too stupid to actually read any of the details in the Twitter files. It's incredible. It really is kind of amazing when you look at this. It goes on. Remember how Elon keeps insisting that the government coerced Twitter uh, to make content moderation decisions? Well, Twitter's own lawyers, who actually have to be truthful about these things apparently, Twitter's own lawyers say that's absolute horse manure will say. I mean, much of the following basically is what my tech dirt posts have explained, except what follows is not tech dirt posts, his or anyone else's. This is the pleadings of Twitter's lawyers in court. The new materials do not evince coercion because they contain no threat of government sanction premised on Twitter's failure to suspend plaintiff's accounts, as this court already held. Coercion requires a concrete and specific government action or threatened action for failure to comply with the government dictate. Even calls from legislators to do something about plaintiff's tweets, specifically Mr. Trump's, do not suggest coercion absent any threatening remark directed to Twitter. The Ninth Circuit has since affirmed the same basic conclusion holding in O'Handley that government officials do not violate the First Amendment when they request that a private intermediary not carry a third party's speech so long as the officials do not threaten adverse consequences if the intermediary refuses to comply. Like the amended complaint, the new materials show at most attempts by the government to persuade and not any threat of punitive action and thus would not alter the court's dismissal of plaintiff's First Amendment claims. Right? If... Eric Swalwell says it's a terrible idea for CNN to cover a Trump rally speech or to give him a town hall opportunity. They really shouldn't do it. 
Is that a First Amendment violation? No. And then Trump will say, well, we'll see about that now that we've got that. If I was president or when he was president, he would say things like, it's a terrible idea for them to carry a Biden speech. And I'm not saying that they have to listen to the government to tell them what they can and can't do. But I'm just saying that if they wanted a license to broadcast, maybe the FCC has some interest in whether or not uh, they're actually covering the news. That's the threat, or at least an implied threat. And you have a better case there. And now the courts would probably say, well, he didn't say he was going to. No, no, no. Maybe, maybe they let him off the hook. But that's the difference. But Trump sees no difference. He, they said, uh, Swalwell said they shouldn't cover my speech. I said they shouldn't cover Biden's speech. What's the difference? The difference is what you said. But he just denies it. Anyway, more from the pleadings. On FBI uh, uh, officials' involvement in all of this, none of the FBI's communications with Twitter cited by plaintiffs evince coercion because they did not contain a specific government demand to remove content, let alone one backed by the threat of government sanction. Instead, the new materials show that the agency issued general updates about their efforts to combat foreign interference in the 2020 election, for example, one FBI email notified Twitter that the agency issued a joint advisory on recent ransomware tactics. And another explained that the Treasury Department seized domains used by foreign actors to orchestrate disinformation campaigns. These informational updates cannot be coercive because they merely convey information. There is no specific government demand to do anything, let alone one backed by government sanction. So, too, with respect to the cited FBI emails flagging specific tweets. The emails were phrased in advisory terms, flagging accounts they believed may violate Twitter's policies, and Twitter employees received them as such, independently reviewing the flagged tweets. None even requested, let alone commanded, Twitter to take down any content, and none threatened retaliatory action if Twitter didn't remove the flagged tweets. As in O'Handley, therefore, the FBI's flags cannot amount to coercion because there was no intimation that Twitter would suffer adverse consequences if it refused. What's more, unlike O'Handley, not one of the cited communications contains a request to take any action whatsoever with respect to the plaintiff's accounts. Plaintiffs claim compensation of Twitter for responding to its requests had coercive force, force is meritless. As a threshold matter, as discussed above, the new materials demonstrate only that Twitter exercised its statutory right provided to all private actors to seek reimbursement for the time it spent processing a government official's legal request for information under the Stored Communications Act. The payments, therefore, do not concern content moderation at all let alone specific requests to take down content. And in any event, the Ninth Circuit has made clear that under a coercion theory, receipt of government funds is insufficient to convert a private actor into a state actor, even where virtually all of the party's income is derived from government funding. So, hey, that's not actually happening, right? Therefore, plaintiffs' reliance on these payments does not evince coercion. Well, what about pressure from Congress? Well, that too is garbage, admits Twitter. The new materials do not contain any actionable threat by Congress tied to Twitter's suspension of plaintiffs' accounts. First, plaintiffs place much stock in a single FBI agent's opinion that Twitter employees may have felt pressure by members of Congress to adopt a more proactive approach to content moderation, but a third party's opinion as to what Twitter employees might have felt is hardly dispositive, and in any event, Generating public pressure to motivate others to change their behavior is a core part of public discourse. Actually, First Amendment protected, right? And is not coercion absent a specific threatened sanction for failure to comply. The new materials do not evince any actionable threat by White House officials either. Plaintiffs on a single statement by a Twitter employee that the Biden team was not satisfied with Twitter's enforcement approach as they wanted Twitter to do more and to deplatform several accounts. That's uh, one of the pieces of evidence they submitted. But those exchanges took place in December of 2022, well after plaintiff's suspensions, and so could not have compelled Twitter to suspend their accounts. Furthermore, 
The new materials fail to identify any threat of government sanction arising from the officials' dissatisfaction. Indeed, Twitter was only asked to join other calls to continue the dialogue. And now our writer joins back in. Basically, Twitter's own lawyers are admitting in a court filing that the guy who owns their company is spewing utter nonsense about what the Twitter files revealed. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like this. Guy takes over a company because he's positive that there are awful things happening behind the scenes. He gives, quote unquote, full access to a bunch of very ignorant journalists who are confused about what they find. Guy who now owns the company falsely insists that they proved what he believed all along, leading to the revival of a preternaturally stupid lawsuit, only to have the company's lawyers basically tell the judge, ignore our stupid effing owner. He can't read or understand any of this. That is a pretty remarkable position for the Twitter lawyers to be in. But of course, when you do all your work under the threat of sanction from the court, you tend to feel like, as much as the boss wants me to do this, I can't be fined, disbarred, or otherwise sanctioned for this idiot's mission. If he wants to destroy the company, that's his business. Hi, I'm Scott Anderson, the guy that writes the daily summary for this show, k in the Morning. Thank you to everyone that supports this show. Many of you send donations through PayPal, Patreon, Square Cash, Radio Public, and so on. Some of you write your own essays and send them in, or read articles with your own commentary. We appreciate it. Now, some of you are listening to this and thinking, I'd like to help, but isn't there something I could do that wouldn't require money or effort? Why, yes, there is. You can just like us. On Daily Coast, they call it the recommend button. YouTube has a thumbs up. There are hearts and likes and love buttons. Tap our love button. Tap our love button every day. Share our shows and summaries on Facebook and Twitter, YouTube and iTunes, Stitcher and Amazon. Most of these places allow you to write a review, so a sentence or two would be great. Recommend us to social media or tell your friends to listen to the show. You aren't just helping us, you're helping them find their new favorite thing to listen to. You could change the world. So thank you in advance for me and everybody else in the world. All right, welcome back now to the Kango in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. And just once again, sneaking in under the wire with the ringy dingy noise is Joan McCarter. <laughs> Good morning, Joan. How you doing? <laughs> Good morning, David. I'm fine. How are you? Uh, excellent. Uh, I'm feeling uh, uh, very tranquil <laughs> now about having read uh, that Twitter's lawyers are in court uh, filing paperwork that says Elon Musk is an idiot and he doesn't understand anything about how this place works. But in the meantime, please dismiss these uh, stupid lawsuits about the, the so-called Twitter files. That must be interesting and fun. And uh, I guess... Uh, if you have to choose between being sanctioned by the court and disbarred and unable to practice your profession and simply being unable to practice your profession on behalf of Twitter anymore, you choose <laughs> you choose the, the, the latter. Yes. And I guess they'll all be fired when this is done, but it'll be interesting uh, as they'll then have an interesting case. I guess they can then sue Twitter and say, uh, hey, Twitter shareholders, the only people who were taking their fiduciary duty to you seriously was us, and we got fired for doing it by the guy who remains the CEO and will be stealing all of your uh, coveted shareholder value now that we're gone, and maybe you should get rid of him, and we should all sue him and get our money uh, out of his pockets. That might be interesting and fun. We'll see whether that occurs. <laughs> he may just leave the lawyers in place. You want a case? I got more money. Donald Trump is embarrassed, but what do I care? Uh, yeah. He could be fine with that. I'm sure he'll be okay with it. Um, anyway, I thought that was fun and interesting. Uh, As a lawyer, who would you rather work for, Trump or Musk? Uh, wow. Holy mackerel. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll say right now, uh, based on the, the information we have in front of us, I'll say Musk only because they have – so far, I guess, been granted the freedom to file these correctly yeah. argued papers. I don't know what happens to them later. They're probably getting paid. Yeah, maybe. Although, who knows? I mean, he's like not paying rent on <laughs> the building. So, yeah, 
Yeah, I guess I can say, but uh, I, I guess if you have to choose one or the other, one guy's got an established record. He doesn't pay his lawyers or other vendors. Uh, Musk is starting to establish that he won't pay rent and maybe some other things, but I don't know. No lawyers have said they aren't getting paid yet. So there's that, and they haven't been fired yet. If they're later fired, then you say, I don't care. I'll throw a dart. What's the difference? Neither one of them is going to pay me, and they're both going to fire me for doing the job right. <laughs> Flip a coin. You pick it. Boy. Well, it's fun to see anyway. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, once again, a reminder that uh, not only is it not the case that having millions or billions of dollars means you're smart, but I'm starting to think it might mean you're dumb, which is too bad <laughs> because – uh, most people have been trained uh, that they should uh, further their education in the hopes of uh, succeeding in life, whether or not that ever means you ever become a billionaire. Chances are no, but um, it's going to do terrible things to education in this country <laughs> if people realize <laughs> actually the dumber you are, the more money you make. So I, I, <sighs> it's not really true. Criminally so, dumb. Yeah. You know, hmm. you can be dumb and you can also be yeah savvy that's true yeah i mean we know plenty of people like that i'm sure you say well you know they're not book smart and you know whatever but uh, yeah, they, they know, know how, how to, to run a mob yeah right there is that that's true i mean just so few college graduates in the mob these days <laughs> you know and so it it colored our opinion of these things but anyway yeah, so uh, since we last spoke, uh, I guess they fixed the debt ceiling. Uh, kind of. Yeah, it's not a problem at the moment. They didn't fix it like, we should get rid of it. They said, we'll keep it. And, uh, and, and of course, lots of other bad garbage went along with it. But uh, by mm -hmm. the way, have I read, do, am I reading correctly that the, there, are usual, there are several options for dealing with a debt ceiling. And we never really stopped to discuss these, although I think we did last time, you know, there was such a crisis, I guess. Well, uh, that is to say, there are at least two ways, basic ways of dealing with it. One is to say, all right, we're going to hit the debt ceiling. Let's raise the debt ceiling. Mm -hmm. That's the one the Republicans hate because then they say, oh, we're now pro debt if we do that. Or right. you can say, yes, we're hitting the debt ceiling. And rather than put a new number on things, we'll say, Let's suspend the debt ceiling. Let's yes. just ignore it by statute. And is that we'll what they opted put for? Put a new date on it. Oh, okay. All right. That's interesting. And say it's not the amount of money that's at issue. It's the, the date. So between now and this new date certain, which brings us past the 2024 elections. And that Barely. was supposed to be a concession to the politics of the situation. Right. Uh, if you violate the debt ceiling, who cares? No number is going to stop us from saying you're not allowed to bother us until 2025 or late 2025. January 1st. Okay. So that's going to I'm be busy an that day. Duck session. By the way, I you know I don't know about you, but don't call me about the debt ceiling on January 1st, 20 anything. But yeah. uh, but they're going to remain available to to do something. So uh, there, the, it's interesting that they pushed it past the election. Of course, the leverage that they'll use then instead is we're running out of time because Christmas and New Year's. Right. So, all right. right. Um, it'll, it'll be the lame duck and, you know, yeah. all the usual the problems apply. You know, if, if if there's lots of speculation you can do determining on, on the outcome of the election, say this. Senate flips to Republicans, the House flips to Democrats. All right. Say Biden loses. Say Biden wins. All of these things, you know, are going to determine what happens in that lame duck mm -hmm. and whether we have a debt ceiling issue yeah. going forward. Um, hey. Yeah. Okay. So, well, at any rate, so that, I mean, that's an interesting thing that'll come into play. And, and it's good to point that out now. So that we know exactly what you're dealing with later, you know. And yeah, it's gonna it's, it's gonna remain ugly. It's gonna remain problematic. Um, so is the spending that's coming up. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. How how the deal sort of worked out the way that they kind of defanged the Freedom Caucus, but not entirely, is by saying, okay, you have to get all 12 appropriations bills passed this year. And interestingly enough, they made it the calendar year rather than the fiscal year. Huh. Okay. Buying them some time. Yes. If we don't do that by the end of this year, then 1% cuts across the board to absolutely everything, including defense. Hmm. Oh, well, that's interesting. Just as an inclusion, they don't yeah, because often do that. What the Republicans did, they because the attacks on them from Democrats about cutting veterans' care were so effective, they said, okay. Everything has to be cut except defense and veterans care. So Hmm. those were the two things in the agreement that were allowed to be increased in funding. Okay. But if they don't come up with all 12 appropriations bills, which they haven't done in like 30 years or something. Hmm. Wow. It's, I think 1996 or 97 was the last time we had regular order. Hmm. in which all of the appropriations bills were passed in time and the government was automatically, you know, th- there were no doubts. Yeah. Anyway. Hmm. Um, yeah. So, so, that's so they can order. increase defense and veterans, but if they don't have the spending bills done, then everything gets cut hmm. across the board, 1%, including defense. That's, they think that's going to keep Republicans in line and they won't try to have a government shutdown. Hmm. What hasn't been resolved is whether that $1.6-ish trillion in spending that the, the bill authorizes is a floor or a ceiling. I mean, how uh, hard is what? that cap? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is it going to be exactly the amount that they said, or can Republicans fight to decrease below that amount, which Hmm. plenty of folks think, yeah, they probably will. So they're still going to make appropriations a fight. They're still going to try to reduce budgets, I I assume, for all of the domestic programs that they hate. All right. Yeah, I guess that, that's that. my assumption. And we're still going to have fights, and there is still a lessened threat of a government shutdown, but it could still happen because mm. because these people are nuts. Well, yeah. Oh, and they want tax cuts. They're already oh, okay. working on the next. Sure, I'll have a couple of those too. Yeah. yeah, and and a couple. Of, I'll take a couple of these crawlers and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'll be taking these huggies and whatever cash you got in the register. All right. Sure. Just throw in whatever you want in the wish list. Uh, interesting. Though, the, the, you, you settle on a, a spending amount and then uh, the settlement afterwards. You say, now, wait a second. Does it mean we can spend more than this if we want to or less than this if we want to? Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, good question. We didn't really settle that. Well, yeah, it's what? not really. It doesn't what was say the point of you must spend this much. Yeah, and and however you do it, you have this has to be the number you reach. You get to divvy it up basically as you see fit. Hmm. Except veterans and and Pentagon have to get this much. Um, yeah. Hmm. Well, okay. So anyway. Fun times. Still yeah, ahead. I'd love to see how this uh, You know, out. it was really interesting to watch the Freedom Caucus basically crumble. Hmm. Well, that's always fun. Um, they're still grumbling about it. They're still mad about it. But nobody is seeming to think that what they can do is a motion to vacate. They're, they're mad at McCarthy. They don't like him. They mm-hmm. think he betrayed them. Yeah. They think he broke promises, promises which... <laughs> he's, he's not sure he made <laughs> maybe he did maybe he didn't i don't know Can't depends tell. on you know whether that three-page addendum to the rules package really did exist that secret document that everybody was talking about in january it's a problem with secrets uh yeah well you know it, it this too fits in with the i guess sort of the theme of the of what has become the theme of the rest of the show is that when you're dealing with people who say things like if you say you don't like my idea, you're violating my First Amendment rights. 
like you're mm-hmm. not, but if you're the kind of person that believes that stuff or you swore an oath to uphold the Constitution and then you voted in a way I don't like. And I think that's unconstitutional. And so therefore you should be, I don't know what, arrested, impeached, thrown in Guantanamo. You're not really in Congress. Like those sorts of people who believe things like that. How seriously to take it when you say, well, right. I think he broke promises. And not only that, they were secret promises on top of that. Right. Even, <laughs> even if they were explicit, you're probably wrong. But yeah. To, and, and then of course. Well, and when you've got people like, you know, Lauren Boebert putting it forward. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Who <laughs> I, decided she missed the vote on on <laughs> wrestling? Well, she was busy figuring out whether or we not don't her know dad was a professional was wrestler. She says she, she she came back and said, "I did that on purpose. <laughs> I I it was a protest. I wasn't going to be a participant in any of this." And uh, then <laughs> video right. surfaced of her tearing up the Capitol steps, trying to get there in time for the vote. So. <laughs> I wanted to say I wasn't going to vote. From the floor. That was my protest. And I meant to run into that glass door in my way. (laughs) Wow. All right. Well, uh, all right. So she's a dope. Yeah. That's really something. Yeah. Anyway, for now, for now, that's over. There were lots and lots of things that I really am not pleased with, but we're not Mm. in default. So. That's number That's one. That's step I guess. one. Yeah. yeah, dollars are still worth dollars, more or dollars less. Dollars are still worth dollars. The debt ceiling is once again a hostage, mm-hmm. as it always will be. Now is perpetual. Yeah. Well, you get concessions when you, yeah. when you do this stuff. So yeah, it works. Uh, uh, anything uh, that's particularly egregious that you want to call out as part of the garbage of the deal, or is. <sighs> I mean, we've kind of touched the garbage, on the big yeah, of some parts. Um, the IRS cuts. Okay. Although, yes, the way that the funding was given, it was over 10 years, but they didn't have any amount that they had to spend over the 10 years. Hmm. The money that the IRS got, the $80 billion the IRS got in yeah. the um, Inflation Reduction Act. So they can front load that. They can spend that same amount of – they can spend as much money as they want in the next few years – and then come back for the rest of it after. So, okay, yes. But, you know, it will still have an impact. Yeah. It also seeds the narrative <laughs> from yes. the Republicans that the IRS is bad and shouldn't have gotten this money. Yeah. Um, the far worse is that, yeah, work requirements are an okay thing. Mm. All right. And should be applied to some some portion of our vulnerable population. Yes. In this case, people getting food stamps who were in their early 50s ah. and probably are on food stamps getting that assistance because they are not in a position to be able to work. Yes, people are not They could be hiring. taking care of family members who can't work mm. and families who can't afford to get outside help. There's yes. there's any number of reasons for these people to not be working. They're working in the home. Yeah. Uh, but that, that doesn't count. And no. and they have to jump through multitudes of hoops in order to eat. Uh, can they appeal to Lauren Brobert and, and say, I, I'm not working as a protest. <laughs> right. I don't want to participate in this crazy system, uh, even though you, you do have video of me going to the, uh, you know, rushing to interviews to try to get a job, but no one will hire me because I'm 59 years old and, you know, they don't think they can get enough productive years out of me before they force me to retire. Uh, And also I can only, you know, I occasionally have to miss work because I'm taking care of somebody at home. Uh, But as a protest, I didn't work. Can I still have my food stamps? No. Yeah. No. Probably not. (sighs) Wow. It's yeah. It's really right. fr- yeah, they it's did. Out of the way, you know, there there are but... glimmers of stuff that are good. For the first time, foster kids aging out of the system will now be yeah, eligible for food stamps without work requirements. That's good. Yes, I'm. I'm but yeah. they but could have targeted the, that, and they did. The overall, the whole way that this went down is just destructive. Yeah. That you know, 
Biden spent all of those weeks saying he's not negotiating the debt ceiling, he's not negotiating while well, he's negotiating the debt ceiling. Mm -hmm. That was a problem. Yeah. The just absolute refusal to to say, yeah, I think that this might be unconstitutional and I am more than willing to test that mm. if you don't shape up. Mm. Yeah. It, it just... A missed opportunity. Set, and, and the idea that because it's bipartisan, it's good. Because oh, wow. nobody got exactly what they needed, it's good. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah. I, just I, by I've virtue been... of the fact that people come out of it not liking it does not mean it was a good solution. It 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 never is. It's an amazing thing that how often that thing pops up but and and, and how counterintuitive it is. It's just like, uh, do you like this? No. Do you like this? No. Do you like this? No. Then it's good. No. Yeah. It, these people don't like it. It's not good. Well, yeah. Well, back in the olden days, that might have meant nobody's perfectly happy because they all conceded something. But that doesn't necessarily uh, – it's not always the case. And, of course, if you're negotiating with people who have no rational idea of – What's good and what's bad for anybody? You know, I don't like it because I believe my philosophy is that you should use the government's power to hurt people that don't vote for you. Are you happy with the outcome? No, I meant to hurt more and more varied kinds of people, and I didn't get the chance to do that. Well, uh, but it must be good because you're slightly unhappy. You know, other people might say, no, I mean, if two people who want to help use the government to, you know, achieve some purpose and and help people in different ways disagree, that's one thing. But, yeah, you know, coming to the middle with people who are like, I would like to use the power of the government to hurt disfavored groups. That's not a compromise that you should measure in traditional terms. It's not a traditional <laughs> compromise. There's no traditional second party to this agreement. So, I don't know. I find that weird. It's you weird. Do too. It's frustrating. It's destructive. Mm. It's <sighs> it's what we're stuck with. Yeah. All right. Well, like we say, the, and, you the know, government continues default. to operate. That's good. Yeah. That's good. We didn't default. Okay. Right. Chip Roy looks kind of ridiculous. That never hurts. That's true. Never That's hurts. Helpful. It's nice to see. I mean... There's an opportunity of sorts. If I thought that McCarthy was the sort of person that learned lessons from things, I might say, well, uh, he thought he was over a barrel the whole time because the Freedom Caucus kept saying, we have won the right to make a motion to vacate the chair. And now they're disappointed and bitter and think McCarthy broke promises, but none of them are filing this motion. McCarthy might take away from this. They're never going to do this because they actually do realize they don't have enough votes to make it work. And it's just going to make us all look ridiculous. Yeah. Why did well, I do this? And nobody else wants the job. Yeah. That's one thing. That's kind of a problem for them. Mm, yeah. Uh, I mean, even Mark Meadows told them no. Oh. <laughs> oh, they were searching outside even. Yeah. I, yeah. And they can do that. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Uh, the, Lauren Boebert's uh, professional wrestler non-dad is maybe, <laughs> although he said he wanted to retire. So, you know, and it's not a conflict right now because uh, he's not her daughter. So it's okay. Right, right. So if you're looking for work, but he says he's not. Uh, all right. Well, okay. Oh, and by, yeah, that would help somebody qualify for food stamps too if they want to help somebody out. Work requirements, make him Speaker of the House. <laughs> You know, could work. Uh, wow. Well, what a what a week it's been. And and now, what a week it's been. Just now back we're to regular on to, craziness. You know what? What? And of course, what McCarthy's going to do is the rest of what they want. It's stupid investigations, clamoring for mm. ridiculous stuff. You know, he's he's going to give in to him on all of this. Um, yeah, I mean, and, you know, he ultimately for, likes this stuff himself. He also says he's not going to authorize. When the deal in the Senate was part of the deal, and it wasn't exactly legitimate, I don't know. Hmm. It wasn't voted on. No. 
Schumer and McConnell gave a promise that, yeah, they would work for a supplemental bill for defense spending, um, primarily for Ukraine. Okay, yeah. Because, you know, you can always come up with more money for defense spending. But in this case, if it's Ukraine, then, yeah, it's probably valid. McCarthy is saying, no, absolutely not. We're not going to do that. Hmm. McCall, who is chair of the... um, Defense committee says, "Oh yes, we are." <laughs> mm-hmm. So that's that's the next oh. fight in the House, uh, whether or not we will help continue to fight the war in Ukraine. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I guess we sort of figured that, that was coming because there are some. Uh, the the Freedom Caucus is rife with nutballs who are sure that something something Donald Trump yada yada no to helping Ukraine. Yes, but well, yeah, <laughs> they're on Russia's side. Yeah. I mean, essentially, that's what it comes down to. Uh, All right. Well, okay. So the Senate says that they would like, the Senate leaders say they would Mm -hmm. prefer to put forward a supplemental. Uh, McCarthy says no, but the chairs of the committee in the House, the Republican chair of the committee in the House that would be responsible for putting it forward wants to do it anyway. Despite what? Okay. All right. Um, and this is, again, going to be sort of a test of McCarthy's yeah, leadership. I guess so. Uh, and, uh, uh, you, the fact that there were, so, there were mm. more Democrats than Republicans voting for the debt oh, ceiling yes. increase. Okay. I mean, they could do this supplemental that's, that's the same way. That's one of the rules that McCarthy supposedly broke. That was one of right. the promises that the Freedom Caucus said he made. Yes, that's I, – I, I, I understood that one. And that could even be real. But again, it's not written anywhere. It's but. not written anywhere. So we don't know if it's real. The other one that, that they, they insisted is that all nine members of the Rules Committee had to unanimously approve anything. All yeah. the, uh, nine Republicans on the Rules Committee. Right. That seems like, no, that probably didn't happen. No, that did not happen. <laughs> I mean, I can't. Cole wouldn't have gone along with that. The chair uh, of the Rules yeah, Committee. Probably not. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's it's a little too convenient for Chip Roy, too. Like basically, it's saying, mm-hmm. unless Chip Roy says it's okay, the House can't do it. Well, I doubt that that's a deal he made with you. No, that, I that cannot strikes imagine me as that that no. deal actually got made. So. But the other one is like, well, you know, after the Hastert rule, and they have to come up with a new rule and a new name because Hastert's gone to prison and he is a <laughs> pedophile. So make it the McCarthy rule. Not that yeah. every... You get the majority of the majority of yeah. so more Republicans voted for it than not, but mm. still passing something primarily with Democratic votes. That's the argument for, yeah, we need to do a supplemental, except, yes. of course, it has to start in the House right. because all funding bills have to originate in the House. So yeah. there's mm-hmm. going to be majority pressure on McCarthy to do it. So we'll All see. Right. Well, file your uh, discharge petition now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and get started. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, that maybe how they have, have to, to do it. Discharge petition again. Yeah. And I will say good for Democrats. They got all 213 of them. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, that's because there was a secret agreement that they would have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no chance that they would actually agree with one another. We have to force it with a secret agreement. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, so that might be, the, you know, it may, we may find ourselves, I'm sure that there will be a discharge petition involved, whether it's the actual vehicle that moves the thing. I don't think so, but, um, yeah, you know, I guess if the chairman of the committee wants it and they move a bill and they run into the leadership, uh, saying, well, we said that we weren't going to do it. Uh, and then they have to play the game of, well, I don't know. The Freedom Caucus didn't move to vacate the chair last time, so right. Maybe we'll do I think, it. I think when it comes, when it is the Ukraine, might specifically be when it is Ukraine, yeah, McCarthy's going to have to do it. Hmm. All right. Well, I that's, uh, that's that's my gut feeling. Yeah, I mean, and certainly now that he's seen no, you know, no, the the the, the Freedom Caucus isn't following up on their threat. You know, well, you broke your promise. Well, you broke your promise. You said you were going to vacate the chair and you didn't. 
So <laughs> it's all we're all even. Uh, it may be that a, a discharge petition becomes a convenience for him. Well, I'm standing tall with the Freedom Caucus, but golly, you know, I can't stop members of the of this conference from signing a discharge petition. They're independently elected for crying out loud. Um, that could be a way around. I don't know. But uh, uh, how long until we find out? And also, uh, was there something specific in the in the agreement or in the deal that uh, that that all twelve of the appropriations bills have to be freestanding bills, or can they? Are they going to? No, I don't allow think so. I think they can do an omnibus. I'm pretty sure so they can easy. do an omnibus. Yeah. All right. So yeah, essentially they're going to end up with uh, probably not regular order. And uh, people will then complain that that breaks the promise too. And yep. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. <laughs> but we'll find that out. And uh, oh, I missed uh, a chance to have you tell us about uh, Marjorie Trader Green doing something. But what did oh, she do? I, I missed don't know. it. Oh no. Well, I have your. It's your story. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you have to see Marjorie Taylor Greene's plan to take down the deep state. Oh, that one, the old one, yes. <laughs> okay, it's been a while. So, yep. okay, we'll all look that up that and read it. Uh, it. Yeah, so sorry. And it's 11 o'clock, but it was pr- appropriate to have the cuckoo chiming. As soon as I said Marjorie Trader Green, the cuckoo yes. started going off. I like it. Good sound effect. Well timed. Thank you, Joan. Uh, appreciate you. catching up with you. We'll catch up uh, again next week. Uh, although I guess we're now approaching almost summer recess time. And by next week, we'll be talking about what they have to finish before July 4th. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Good to hear from you again now uh, with the debt ceiling out of the way. Uh, less you tense. Too. Okay. Next, next week, we'll talk about something more fun. Yay. All right. And the clock okay. will go off at 11. See you then. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Time now for us, cuckoos, to hand things over to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Cuckoo. And we'll see what we got on tap here. John Bolton. What's John Bolton doing in here? John Bolton might throw his hat into the ring and run for president, maybe. I didn't even know he had a hat. He should throw his razor into the ring because he's not using that. From NetworksRadio.com, you have been listening to Kegro in the morning. Well, okay, he's using it to shave his beard, but not that crazy mustache. What else has he got on the rest of the menu? California is citing California's increasing wildlife risk and soaring construction costs. State Farm and Allstate have stopped writing new policies in the nation's most populous state. That is a huge story. I haven't touched it. Thankfully, he'll do so next.